it's almost like me, right? Like I was like the middle child. <laughs> <laughs> Bro's gonna, bro's gonna draw some analogy around himself and a billion dollar company. I already no, know it's coming. I mean. <laughs> What is up, everybody? I am Michael Zakond, and I'm joined by my co-founder and co-host, Simran Sandhu, and you're watching Our Future Podcast. This is the go-to podcast for young entrepreneurs. We study the hottest up-and-coming young founders and break down their businesses and do a little clown along the way. So today, we're covering a really interesting entrepreneur named Grant Roscoe, and he's built a cash management platform for startups. Uh, so that company's raised, I think, over $6 million now. Grant's been working on it for a while. It's certainly evolved throughout the years, started in a, a more interesting way that I'll get to. But yeah, he's a 23-year-old founder. Pretty impressive that he's been able to, to make a mark for himself in fintech at such a young age. It's always, it, personally, it's always impressive to me, dude, when uh, a young person is able to get into such a regulated industry. What do you think? Yeah, totally agree. But I will say, like, what a better industry than being able to manage money, man. You're yeah. right where all the action is. Yeah, man. Managing money is where all the money is at, right? So yeah, <laughs> uh, it's. It, but the thing is, is that like the hot thing in managing money is always different. So I'll tell you about Grant's story a little bit, which is is pretty crazy, right? Like grows up in suburban Lincoln, Nebraska, like hometown of Warren Buffett, and like seems to reject the path. So doesn't go to college, starts his own company at 17 or 18 years old. He's currently 23 years old never goes to college and builds Crescent, for, Crescent First as a crypto exchange. And I know this because he started a YouTube channel where he was documenting his journey and he actually got a lot of views, uh, but he only made two videos. Um, but you could see kind of what his vibe is, right? Which is like young bull, um, definitely thinks differently, kind of like a black swan in his small hometown, like definitely has that energy to get out. And yeah, Crescent started as a crypto platform and there's like videos of him partying in Monaco and pitching on yachts and stuff. And it's funny that, you know, the pivot he made into cash management um, became the hot thing once crypto was gone and once interest rates went up. Cash management, high yield savings was the place to be. Definitely always changes. I guess looking back, maybe crypto was the place to say. Uh, I know like everyone's going crazy with the True. whole Bitcoin spot ETF thing. So for Grant, at least, it's a cool business, right? There's a, there's a lot of... Um, you know, people playing in the space. I've seen Meow. I've seen, you know, companies like Arc do this too. Um, but the general premise is, you know, you get somewhere near 5%, you know, yields on your business savings account. And, you know, to, to an extent, there's a lot of insurance coverage too. I think um, in Crescent's case, they will provide up to $125 million in coverage, million. right? Yeah. yeah. I'm assuming that's revolving banks though. So it's like they spread the money across several different banks and institutions. That's kind of what Meow does well uh, as well. Cause if you look at like some of the other big players, it's like, you know, you have Brex, you have Mercury, which are also banks too. Right. And so they will provide coverage anywhere in, I think the single digit million. So, you know, kind of as being, you know, the upstart in the space, you kind of have to find a way to, to, to find your angle. Right. And so, in the game of fintech, you're either helping people make more money or you're providing a safer outlet for them to to, to be confident and reduce risk there. So what doesn't um, seem I'm to, assuming those are kind of the angles that they're they're looking at. What doesn't seem to stack up though is that not only does Crescent uh guarantee more insurance, 125 million more than what Brex and Mercury do, but it also offers higher yields. Um so it feels like it's not a necessarily product overall. not necessarily. They they all offer around five okay. percent. Like the going thing in this in this industry is prime plus one, right? And they they take a little bit for themselves. for themselves. So yeah. But yeah. What I will say though is, it may seem. I think we were having a conversation before this about parity in this space, right? Like yeah. all these businesses are the same. They're like a commodity business, right? Wherever you put your cash, you can get a reasonable rate. The thing is, is when you're dealing with millions of dollars, right? Each 0.01 percentage point counts, right? So getting a rate between four point, going from 4.75% on your money to 5.1% or even 5.0 or 4.95 is a big difference when it comes to the interest generated on that cash, right? 
So there is like totally when you have millions of dollars in the bank, like it's huge. Even right. if you thought look at like five percent on say a startup that's raised three million dollars, that's an extra one hundred and fifty grand a year, yeah, right? Like exactly. Look at those boys that fast. It's like, dude, <laughs> someone gave you a hundred million dollars and you guys were only able to make six hundred thousand dollars in cash. They should have just saved that shit in the bank and let that be their printing, you know, what? You know cash flow machine. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what I think? I Forget the business they're just in the yeah most startups What's raise that? money and live off the interest like it's more money than that <laughs> <laughs> now i understand not. we're all you, now i understand where this you know plush lifestyle comes from it's like you go to a fancy dinner you know the vc funded company is going to take care of it they yeah. got all this uh extra yield coming in every month baby they're they're, they're loaded yeah dude also so. for the founder just skim that little interest and you know who knows where your money's stored right you can take it home i guess they can thank mavericks like grant over here being able to provide that outlet to them well yeah so what we were saying is like there's a lot of companies that are serving this particular space. You know, it's funny. I didn't even yeah. know what ARC did until today. So for a little bit of context, <laughs> me and Sydney went to SF Tech Week and suddenly we're being ushered into the giant stadium and getting a locker room tour. And we're literally walking on the field of like the San Francisco Giants MLB. And I was like, Simi, this feels really zero interest rate. But the <laughs> truth is, it was the opposite of, a, of zero interest rate. It's when interest rates are high that this company's winning. So it's like, well, all the startup, I was like, wait a minute, this is a company related to startup fundraising and capital. I was like, how the fuck are they renting out a stadium? And then it just occurred to me that they are on the good side of startup fundraising and that they benefit from the higher interest rates. So this, yeah. this legion of companies like Meow, Crescent, uh, Arc, they couldn't be having a better moment than 2022 to 2024. Right. Totally. I also think, you know, what's interesting is like it is a regulated space, but when you have a lot of players, it does become a marketing and distribution game. So I think, you know, to Rex's criticism, a lot of what, you know, when when they're kind of stacked up against ramp and I know that's like an entirely different use case there. Um, but the big criticism is like. Brex has been able to win so long just because, you know, they played the marketing and sales game better. And it's not necessarily indicative that the product and engineering side has always been, you know, at par with that. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested, man. I think, you know, Grant's clearly like, you know, he thinks differently. He's found his unique angle six years in. He's been able to kind of, uh, you know, make some area for himself. Where do you think this business goes? Um. You know, I would just imagine like any other fintech, right, where it evolves arms and legs through different financial products, right? Like, remember, we were watching Vlad Tenev. He was like, yeah, we're getting into IRA, right? I really think that's just the avalanche of, of fintech is like you just add on more financial products to your existing user base and you upsell them into new services to the point where you become a much more advanced platform. Um, for Grant, you know, they're you know, they position themselves not as a bank because they just use a, you know, a partner bank. That's how this entire industry works. Yeah. Fintech first company, bank and, and it's, yeah, people yeah. are like, oh, there's a company called First Bank that's, that's fueling the money. They're, they're providing the banking services. There's another services. one called Evolve Bank and Trust, which Mercury depends on. That's their anchor, right? So there's all private yeah. banks. I actually think that's a good business being a white label bank for fintechs because fintechs are just the sexy totally. software wrapper yeah. that goes over a traditional Bill and Bob Nashville bank. You know what I mean? Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. It's the marketing thing uh, at the end of the day, like the big, you know, parallel that comes to my mind and, you know, shout out to, um, David Senrat founders, right there. He did an episode on visa. It was super, super interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, D Hawk, but the premise was like, you know, visa has this middleman service and like, um, at the time it was like bank of America was like, you know, the, the primary infrastructure for like this credit card network but it was all these banks you know at the time that were having to do all the marketing so it was on them to go and get all the customers and like they're providing the funding at the back end but this is kind of a similar play right like the the banking partner in this case is providing the infrastructure the capital and then you have you know fintechs who can go and like get customers and go make products yeah. out of this so i agree with you it's like like anything else being the the infra infra person or company is like where the money's gonna yeah, be dude. It kind of makes me want to get into fintech like can't do can't do addition <laughs> or subtraction for my life but can i market something and make it sexy 
Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, but yeah, it's crazy how long he's been building this business. Uh, I think it's really impressive that he chose like not to go to college, especially growing up in like probably like a Christian ass, like, you know, white bread, wonder bread house, you know, and doing a crypto business and traveling the world. And, and you know, now he's living in San Francisco. He told me he's about to move into a, a founder's house with a bunch of, of people. So um, yeah, I mean, the company's definitely in a good spot, I think. Um, but I could imagine it's getting pretty hard to like fight for customers now. Um, you also mentioned uh, there's a lot of risk. This reminds me of uh, what we were talking about with Tavis. It's like, look, you have HubSpot, Salesforce, Pipedrive. Uh, there's a couple of big CRM platforms, right? Apollo. Um, and then they're just going to kind of verticalize all the different features. So whenever a company comes out with a cool sales tool, it just makes sense for them to verticalize and use that as advantage for their own platform. Um, with Mercury and Brex, they're the major startup bankers. They could just add this feature and you don't ever have to leave the platform or mess around with moving your money. Yeah, but then the values, like the niches, right? So like, you know, that saying niches are where the riches lie. Like there are going to be specific industries that have very intense capital needs. Maybe it's a terms transactions play. Maybe it's, um, you know, like for these guys, I thought something that was unique was like the, the integrations involved. Like they, they seem to have the most sophisticated system across like all the integrations to other banking partners and things like that. Right. So I think that's the other angle you go is like when the general area has become pretty cluttered with a bunch of, you know, customers playing that, you know, wide net strategy, you can just focus in on one specific niche. Like, I know it's not exactly the same, but like, other credit card companies we've covered in the past, why they've oh, been yeah. able to get ground is like, they're just covering e-commerce. They're co covering creators, right? And it's like, so find that that like area where you can get sticky customers. It doesn't necessarily need to be as high volume, but you can build a massive company serving like just one specific I area. It also goes back to uh, the fact that every percentage point matters. So the companies that are focused and devout when it comes to finding the best yields, are going to be a better choice for startups than what a Brex or a Mercury could provide with like a, maybe a couple people focused on that for that one feature set that doesn't really matter for them. Totally. I'm also thinking like, you know, if I was going to go do something in this space, what were, what would I think about? Right. So I'd probably focus on an area that is generally capital intensive and requires like vast amounts of funding, right? So it's like, I'm not even going to play in the single digit millions, low eight figures. It's like, can I build a very specialized, unique business around like a handful of clients, but we're doing things in the, in the nine figures, probably easy said than done, but that's probably how I would think about it. It's like people that need to park their money for a, for a long time uh, for R&D purposes. Maybe it's, you know, like uh, an example could be like within the healthcare space, like you have pharma companies that are shelling out billions. So you'd it would be tough because you'd have to to play against like JP Morgan and like traditional banking partners. Um, but there's probably an area around that. Maybe you're playing in the 50 to $200 million range and that's how you segment out an industry for yourself. Um, but I think I think there's an area depending on whatever customer segment you're looking where at. Do you, where do you think he goes from here? I, th I think it depends on like how much more money he raises, right? So it's like if he does at at six million, right? Like you you have to be careful you don't spread your, spread yourself too thin, right? And so it's like, okay, we're gonna work with a handful of partners. We're gonna try to do the best we can, and hopefully it kind of grows organically. But you know, you're, you're working with another company on the infrastructure side, like. I think you will have to pick a specific segment. I don't know what industry he focuses in on or like what area that looks like specifically, but I think you will have to specialize unless you go and raise a shit ton more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's... How, how do you compete with like a, a Brex or a Mercury, right? Like or even those companies Arc. have been around Arc's, forever and they're well even capitalized. Even Meow have probably raised a lot more. Like he's probably the least capitalized of all of them. Yeah, but it's the, the the I will say the good thing is is like he can kind of see what works for some of these other people. Like the great thing with, you know, maybe other startups who's raised a shit ton of money is like they're just going to like spray and pray, right? Of most of the time. And so you can find like just watching them what is working well and then you put all your resources in that yeah. area, right? So now it's like taking all your eggs and applying it in one basket. But you get to see which basket is the most sturdy. I like that. Um, one. That's a good analogy. So that's kind of what I, I'm I like guessing. That. You yeah. That one out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there's something to be said for being like the nimble, lower capitalized player and just 
it's almost like me, right? Like I was like the middle child. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, chill. <laughs> bro's gonna bro's gonna draw some analogy around himself in a billion dollar company i already yeah, know it's coming I mean, more of a six million dollar go ahead but i was like the middle <laughs> child my brother was two years ahead of me and what i would do is just watch the mistakes he made and i didn't make them so i would right <laughs> for so sure he would like i don't know for sure drink yeah, yeah. Drugs, whatever i mean i did that but you know he, he would just do it to a greater extent and i would just kind of change my path and i think like Grant, there's something to be said, especially in an industry like fintech, we're getting carried away. It's kind of like status quo for a founder in the space um, to chase the hottest new trend or the, the newest money stream or the best rate or whatever. Um, you know, he definitely can lock down that that niche and, and build like, you know, a good moat for himself, not through tech, not through patents, but through focus and like a commitment to customers who've put tr and trusted him with their money. The good thing about fintech is it's so sticky. If you put millions of dollars, if you entrust millions of dollars to someone, you're probably not going to move it. Totally. It because again, it's a it's a customer thing, right? Like how do you how do you acquire these customers? The customers, yeah, know, you know, uh, because it's high switching costs, right? Like if you're going to move millions of dollars in, you know, uh, like that's that that requires so much thought and like you have to really be sure, right? Like this isn't like you're just changing your, you know. Um, like a sales and marketing software where you're changing your CRM. This is like all the yeah. money that is quite literally the lifeline for your yeah. business. You're going to be so smart about where you're allocating it, right? So it's like probably a lot of deep research. You make a decision and then you got to feel good of, good about it unless they give you a reason to, to, to change your mind, right? And so that's when like the SVB stuff happened. And I think a lot of people were like, oh shit, like maybe we should be thinking about more legacy partners where we know this might not happen, right? But that was very much like no one was thinking about that until like it all just yeah. kind of collapsed, right? So, and then it caught everyone kind of like back Businesses footed. with high yeah. switching costs are the best. Like I think B2B staff yeah. falls into this category, I agree. right? Because training and re-educating people on a new platform ah. is such a big expense. And with finance, it's like moving money. Who wants to do that? No one wants to do that. I think it depends. I think it depends. I think it's like the cost involved. Uh, for example, right? Like if I'm using a B2B software company, that's like $25, $50 a month, right? Like I'm not going to think twice. Yeah, that's I'm not more of an enterprise um, grade, but a couple thousand yeah. a month type software business. You know, it's super funny. Have you seen what's going on on Twitter uh, where Chamath said some shit yesterday where he was just like, hey, send me any enterprise software that you use and we're going to essentially make it for, uh, you know, we're going to do it at a margin of the cost and we'll give it to you at like an 80% discount. And it like pissed a lot of people off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just, like his way of saying did, that, like, that's no mo did software. did to SaaS founders what yeah. Mark Cuban did to, to pharma companies. It's like... Stop charging these ridiculous rates. I'm just going to give you cost plus pricing, you know? Dude, I don't, I don't know. I'm not overly bullish on the whole, like, Mark Cuban pharmacy thing. I think the cracks will show eventually. Um, any of the, like, big healthcare entrenched people that I've talked to have not necessarily said, like, oh, this is, this is sticky. I think it's a lot of, like, personal branding driven even for him. Like, that's why they're getting traction, if Well, you're any. a good person to comment on it. You used to be deep in the pharma industry. You know, dude, they, those people over there must, must think you're a genius, bro. You left your job at Lilly. <laughs> months later, you sold your fucking company. <laughs> here we are now talking about marketing tips and diagnosing like companies, but in, you we're here for like it, man. In Lily's hallways, to an extent, no, no, I they forgot the about me, bro. Yeah, it's, it's probably like, like a little vacuum in there, like a little a, echo chamber, a little vacuum. Well, it's it's super interesting, right? It's like something it matters, and you think about something, and then like you know, two weeks later, it's just like it's it's a funny thing in general, right? Like when something is a is a priority to you. And then, um, you know, and a priority to others. And then like a month goes by and you're, it's like, dude, why were we sweating so much about that thing? Like it didn't even matter in the, in the context of things. I think like, there's just so many ever changing things going on in anyone's life that like, it's yeah. like out of sight, out of mind yeah. kind of thing. It's interesting in companies, like a lot of the things people do is to like impress or appease their manager and not really looking at data or information. It's just like, what's going to make the person above me happy it doesn't matter what that is in context of the business.
kind of wild. Kind of wild to think totally. about. Totally. I think I think software is kind of the same thing, right? Like it's like why have a lot of them spent so much on the marketing side? It's like, oh, you know, I, I think like another example of this, not necessarily directly in the fintech, but is like Beehive, right? Like it's like I if I I can't tell you how many people have come to me and asked, hey, should we use Beehive as a provider? Right. And it's just because they're constantly in your face. Right. So it's like you see something enough times, you're yeah. probably going to think, oh, maybe they are doing something better. Maybe I should be yeah. thinking about that. Dude, that guy, um, that's the real that value. Guy, of Tyler's marketing. just tweets all the time, like every product update. That's his business. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Twitter's his market. And then, you know, Beehive uh, is definitely like a social consumer, you know, type brand that needs to be out there all the time. Uh, but it, yeah, goes to show for like B two B companies. I guess you could count Beehive as a B two B company. You know that being in your face as much as possible is really, really important. Um, yeah. But yeah, topic change. Back to Grant. Um, what I think is interesting about what he did is he was looking at this market right where you know things were changing in the startup world. I think you know as the market changed in twenty twenty two, he was looking at companies like Ramp that were making a killing. So, you know, how do you conserve, how do you, how do you extend your runway as a startup? I think that's like the basic question, right? How do I stick around for longer, right? I'm really going to uh, reduce my expenses, which is what everybody was focused on, right? Ramp, Brex, so much software tooling around like managing expenses, um, payroll, uh, you know, companies were implementing layoffs, but what's the other side of the coin, right? How do I, re you know, how do I, St stick around for longer, I grow that money by not spending it. So he like, kind of like looked at it on the opposite side of the spectrum as to what everybody was kind of looking at and being like, okay, I'm gonna go over here and just, you can make money passively off the money that you raise that will help you go longer instead of just having it sit in a 1%, you know, per year account. So I yeah, totally. Why do you, yeah, you said he's going to be in San yeah. Francisco, right? Dude, I wonder if it makes sense for him to just be out in New York. I know Arc is also in San Francisco. It's just like I feel like a lot of just banking in in like if you're it, like you should go to the hub and where your customers are. And I feel like for finance, there's probably not a better place. You know, Bank of America was started in San Francisco. Wells Fargo is headquartered in San Francisco. There's more fintech there than you would think, but it's all about where your customers are. And I think for Arc and Grant, yeah, there's a huge, like there's just so many well-capitalized companies in San Francisco. Um, I mean, New York as well, but when it comes to like tech startups, San Francisco. Hmm. You know, maybe, maybe it makes sense. Series B, I, series are, are we, yeah. Are we, are we, are we predicting that he goes through a fundraise here soon? I think he might. Yeah. I mean, he's in a house. With series, I, I think it could make sense. Series A founders, yeah. right? It's all about comparison. You know, you got to match that. All right. Well, we're calling our shot on the Our Future podcast. We think Grant's going to raise around, and we think it's going to be somewhat soon. Grant, raise around. <laughs> um, we're, we're rooting for you. <laughs> but yeah, kudos to him for building and carving out his niche in a really like interesting space. Did we even talk about SVB? By the way, like SVB, like yeah, not dude, much. This, uh, just these a businesses bit. feel like a response to the angst of SVB, right? Of like, yeah, SVB yeah. was a company that was you know having startups store their cash in it. And now it's like, we're going to guarantee you up to 125 million. That's wild. Um, I've never seen a banking, a bank guarantee 125 million, but for startups, it's, you know, make or break uh, for their fundraise. You have to hold on to that cash. Yeah. Otherwise you're done. Yeah. I, I also wonder like, you know, if some shit was to go like hit the fan, could they actually like guarantee that 125 mil? Like, is it more of a marketing ploy or like, could they actually go do that? That's a lot of freaking money. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know who, but who's, yeah, but nobody's putting 125 million into it, you know? Yeah, yeah. you're probably right. I just, I just found it so interesting. Cause like when I was looking at Brex and Mercury, I think, I think Mercury was like, no, I know Brex was up to six mil, right? And so if you go from like six million to 125, like that, what a, a wild range. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't know. Maybe I would feel more secure knowing that like a traditional banking partner Look, is man, behind this. And it's not a fintech. I would say 
is yeah. just how important credibility is in fintech. And especially from my perspective as a consumer, yeah. you know, I'm so hesitant. I'm very protective, but we know we're, as humans, we're very loss averse. You know, we were talking to the CMO of Fundrise yesterday, and I liked his approach that credibility needs time to incubate and build, right? It's so hard to entrust your money with like a fresh new startup in fintech. I just think it's like, you know, even Arda, right? We worked with this company, Arda Finance, doing a hedge fund in your pocket type mobile app. And they were like, we'll get you guys in, no minimum, you know, uh, beta, no fee, whatever. I'm still like, you know, I don't really care that they've raised a hundred million in their ex-Googlers. It still feels risky. Um, and I think this SMB yeah. thing has definitely hurt perception in the industry for sure. Uh, when it comes to fresh new businesses and fintech, what what do you think about it? Yeah, I think people now will have to play a more like risk averse game. It's it's like it's like you know everything's good until like the dominoes fall, and then it's like okay, you know, like we have to reassess how we've done everything. And I think that that was kind of that watershed moment for a lot of these fintech startups. It's like, hey, like we have to be really smart about like the kind of coverage we're giving people because. If we lose people's money, that's the end of our business. Um, and so how can we kind of give that perception of security? Honestly, that's what it really is. And so that's where it's like, can we tie ourselves to a banking partner that has been around for decades, hundreds of years? I mean, that's that's really the question, right? Like, it's like, how do you get someone to trust you over a JP Morgan, which is like, been around forever and like if jp morgan was to go down like then this the the entire global economy is yeah. like fucked right so it's like you're you're kind of you have to compete against the status quo it's like there will not be a safer banking partner than a jp morgan so like what can you offer how do you play it differently right so it's like okay well here's another trusted partner um and we're gonna arrange things that a little bit differently so it, you know you don't even have to worry about like ever getting to a point where you lose yeah. all your money um, and they can't, they can't, you know, guarantee it because I would doubt JP Morgan would ever like cover 125 million for your business, unless you're some, you know, golden yeah. duck that they've really been trying to recruit and they're doing some backdoor getting deal. JP Morgan or an established bank as a partner for a FinTech business, I feel is one of the most valuable partnerships that can be made. Um, like our boy, Mark getting Amex to partner with him, right? Credibility yeah. is so important. But the thing about fintech is like your odds of going to jail are way higher than any other startup that you can possibly build. <laughs> Again, it's like you're playing with people's money, man. Yeah, it's like that's lives, when all the jokes man. are. Yeah, the jokes, the jokes fly, fly away. Man. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. I remember when SVB was collapsing and I called our boy Matthew, who's, who runs Fetty, was like, yo, they're having this like sick party on Lake Travis. Um, bring a date like, you know, wine and cheese, all the all the stops, all the bells and whistles. And. Yeah. I call him and I say, dude, like SVB's <laughs> collapsing. <laughs> and he had no idea. Bro was probably just running his vans and shit. So he gets crunching. And then the next day he's like, yo, are we still going to go to this thing? I'm like, dude, you can have all your money lost <laughs> and you still want to go to this fucking party? <laughs> oh, that was a funny time. If only more startup <laughs> founders thought like that. It's funny. I think that probably describes the Austin startup economy, like startup ecosystem pretty well. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. The funny thing is we were at South by Southwest and it was all happening during this conference of startups, but like nobody cared because like I don't think really anyone had any money, you know, like it's not really like those startups yeah, yeah, yeah. capitalized, but we're out of the woods. You know, we never, we never worked with SVB. We are. Any uh, anything tactical we should leave the viewers with before we uh, we call it close for the app? Well, I would end again and double down on credibility and that if you can establish yourself and no matter what industry you are to a bigger and more credible name, it's the biggest cheat code, I think, in all of business. So for my friend, Mark, who's built HyperCard, it's a credit card company. Uh, I think they're kind of yet to be fully public. Sam Altman's an investor. They will refuse to launch and they still aren't public. Uh, uh, getting Amex on board. Like that was everything, right? They just put everything into like securing that first partner from, from, from the jump. Now it's really only something an experience, maybe second time founder, uh, great connections can pull off. But I think founders who are patient in designing their businesses to, to start with a stamp of credibility can go, I think can, can move a lot quicker from the onset, especially in a regulated space. 
Yeah, and you have to be willing to ride it yeah. out, right? Like this is not a few, you know one to two year game. Like I, it, it, I think especially if you're not well capitalized, like these com- other companies that are such well funded, like they're gonna go through this money and it may take them three, five, six years. Your kind of hope is is that like they make all the fuck ups and then when all the you know dust settles, you're kind of like the the one partner that's trusted and you're yeah. still around and everyone kind of yeah. comes to you. It's just like. How do you play poker in those six years with the other guys? You know, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's by just folding every single round. It's like we're not even yeah, going to buy it. <laughs> the problem is when you're dealing with like people just get greedy when money is around. Like that's fintech for you, man. Totally. But anyways, what I was going to say is us being attached to Morning Brew was like such a bo- uh, boon for our bit or, ba- or boon for our business. And that, you know, whenever we want to work with someone, you know, it's just like being attached to that name makes them all the more likely to, to spend with us versus just some independent operator. Because there's so many random media companies and agencies, right? Getting getting that attachment to a greater brand. I know we sold our business to get here, but what I'm saying is it is a cheat code. And that's just what I really want to emphasize is credibility with a larger brand, however you can achieve it, whether it be getting them on your cap table, a strategic, an advisor, whatever, it just matters so much in all of business. And I, I think like to take that one step further, another way to do it if you don't necessarily want to align with the strategic um, is be very intentional about how you structure your team. Like your first five to 10 hires are probably the make or break it decisions for your business. Like they're, it's so foundational. So tapping into people maybe who've worked at several of the other companies in your specific space and kind of been through it, have connections that you can lean into. Um, also such a cheat code and you don't have to take any major risks by aligning yourself with one specific partner if that's the game yeah, you don't want to play too. i think there's lots of ways to achieve credibility with grant like it, he on his website it's like we have team members from nasa and goldman sachs right that's another way right recruiting people from big names. yeah huge um, that's huge I think you need social proof social is the proof biggest is thing just for need, sure like, one or two things yeah. for social proof to be successful i think in business as a startup founder um and there's multiple ways to achieve it like we said so think about it. All right, cool. Well, on that note, that wraps up another episode of Our Future Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Like always, we come week after week, hopefully with cool stories that you guys enjoy. We'd love some feedback. So tell us what you like, what you don't like. And as always, please subscribe and like the episode on YouTube. So catch y'all next week. Stay frosty.